Hello and welcome to the Sprint 70 review. Uh, today we will, we will tell you about the last two weeks of the Manager Q Sprint. Next slide. Um, so as usual, I'll go over the uh, Sprint statistics. Carol will give us an update on the community. Harpreet on the Classic UI. Chris K on the Service UI. Rona and Adam on the providers. Um, Tina will update us on Automate. Greg T on the platform, Alberto on the REST API, and Chris on documentation. Next slide. All right, so uh, the sprint, we saw a rise in the number of uh, pull requests merged to 473. So that's averaging, what, 200, almost 240 a week. So quite a good clip of uh, pull requests merge, which means even more pull requests are being reviewed. So probably over 300 pull requests getting reviewed every week. Um, quite a big number. Um, next slide, please. Okay, as we're approaching the release of Caprine de Shvili, um, there's a focus on getting enhancements uh, finalized. So. As you can see, more than a third, 37% are enhancements, about a quarter are bugs, and uh, the rest of the pull requests are neatly split into the uh, various other categories. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we had a bump up. So um, this sprint, we had uh, one of our uh, it was a sprint with a lot of pull requests merged. Uh, I think the last time we had this many was in sprint 64. Um, not this many, but if you look at the graph there, um, this is the highest since sprint 64. So uh, we're in a good path here. Uh, hopefully it'll continue as we go forward. Next slide, please. And on the health of the various repositories, um, no significant change that I can see here. Uh, the Manager IQ repo had a drop of 33 issues. Um, uh, the Kubernetes provider had a bump of 0.05 in its GPA, which is a lot, as well as the Overt provider also a bump of 0.04, which is uh, a good bump. Uh, the Amazon and Azure providers went down slightly. It'll be good to investigate why. Um, the rest of the uh, repositories were uh, relatively unchanged. Next slide, please. And over to Carol for the community update. Hi, thank you, Oleg. So for the community, uh, for this sprint, um, as usual, we have the uh, two weeks of last week in Manager IQ, and uh, this time by Laura and David. Um, uh, David's uh, entry has uh, some nice pictures as well, so yes, to the enjoyment of the post, both really nice posts. In addition, we have an interesting blog post about finalizers uh, by Joe, um, and uh, also which also introduces a new tag for developers, so we hope to see more of these type of posts on the blog. Very welcome addition. And on the event side, uh, we have a couple of events coming up. Um, we don't have, uh, it's, it's not like a, uh, our own Manage IQ booth, but we have Red Hat booths with uh, upstream uh, projects being uh, highlighted there. So we'll probably have some Manage IQ uh, demos or uh, training in those two events in Prague and in San Francisco. And uh, recently, uh, thanks to Florian and John, um, there's been a lot of several um, PRs for uh, making some updates and fixes to the website, uh, including typos, links, and also uh, updating the user guides to reflect the latest releases. So thanks to that. And I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Joe, also known as Smithy, because um, a lot of times the, the background work to maintain and keep the website up and running, it's you know unseen, but it's a lot of work, so thanks for that. So, And finally, for the survey, uh, we closed it 
last week. And um, thanks to everyone who has responded. We got some really great uh, feedback and comments, and um, we will uh, organize them and share some information about those uh, interesting information from, from the survey. So that's it for this week. And um, next slide, please. Thank you. Actually, this is Dan talking about the Plus UI. Uh, we forgot to change the first slide, so Harpreet is not doing it today. Uh, anyway, um, PRs merged a little bit down. I'm not exactly sure why, I, I, uh, but uh, the concentration on bugs is, is evident there. Uh, we've done a lot of refactoring over this release, and we're now trying to clean everything up before, uh, as much as we can before the code freeze uh, comes uh, at the end of the month. Uh, but also did get some enhancements in and uh, some some more refactoring and and you can see there also the ui components got some got some love as well um, on the refactoring side uh some uh updates to uh, classes that have been renamed uh the continuous uh changes of uh the active record calls to 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 uh, find objects try to get rid of the old style and uh obviously just a lot of other things that we see in the ui on the enhancement side um We've got some work done to allow overriding the help menu items because uh, uh, a lot of times uh, uh, people want to change the URLs and the text that, that are set up there in those menus. So we try to make them uh, customizable inside the UI. Uh, the API needed some features to be controlled by RBAC. So um, they weren't necessarily mapped to UI features. So we've added a, a whole node for the API in the features tree. Um, we've got the generic object class UI almost completed the uh, everything except the delete, and then uh, that's that's coming. And uh, Ansible playbook button custom buttons can now be created. So next slide. Here's the uh, API features. Um, I'm sure those will grow in the future, but uh, for now, that's uh, those are the two new ones that they needed. That are like again, so do not relate to the uh, stuff above, which is all UI related. Next slide. The generic object class editor. So now you can actually go in and create and edit uh, generic object classes. So you can uh, create these in the UI um, to be used for mostly for automate things and trying to capture things inside of our inside of the manage IQ that uh, aren't there, you know, out of the box. So you can create uh, things like I don't know <laughs> anything you want. Actually, we're going to see what what people use it for. Next slide. And you can now create custom buttons that uh, execute Ansible playbooks. So all of the information there, uh, similar to other places where we run Ansible playbooks, uh, is all configurable here. And you can create a custom button that will kick that off. And I think that's it for the Ops UI. Next slide. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've got a couple new features we wanted to talk about for the service UI. <clears throat> we've now updated the custom buttons to include uh, three states, uh, which are shown and hidden, and shown but disabled. So previously, we only had shown and hidden, and now we've had that disabled option. Uh, we've added the ability to reconfigure orders when duplicating an existing order. Uh, we've done a, a significant overhaul uh, on the group switching. So it's greatly improved and now uses the API, so it should uh, switch groups significantly faster. Uh, we've added a new lifecycle menu on the uh, VM page. We've added some additional RBAC elements. Uh, the help menu can now be turned off and the app switcher can now be turned on and off. And we've done various um, bug fixes and of course updated our dependencies. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to kind of preview out what we're doing too. This is the new um, VM detail screen, which Alan is working on. Uh, so it's a, it's a great new uh, feature that we're looking forward to launching, but I just want to give everyone kind of an update. As you can see, it's it's starting to really fill out. Uh, right now, we're just putting in the data from the API and, and putting it in there. Uh, next slide, please. And on to Bruno and Adam. Okay. Um, so today, uh, Adam and myself are going to share updates from the Azure popular OpenStack. Kubernetes, Rev, and then all more providers. Next slide, please. So most merged pull requests this sprint came from the Kubernetes provider, uh, followed by Azure, then OpenStack, and VMware, and then a sprinkling from the remaining providers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
the last sprint, we demoed um, support for editing uh, provider Ruby configuration files through the advanced settings. But we realized that manually applying the server level settings across all appliances in an enterprise is not scalable. Uh, so this sprint, James wrote a script that will replicate um, a server level setting across all appliances. Um, this can be done for um, any server, server level setting, not just provider specific ones. Um, so James has created a, a demo of this. You'll see on, uh, we have two servers, server one and server two on the left. And actually here we're looking at server two and the additional instance types is empty. Did you want to keep this again? Or just start at the beginning? Sure, you want me to start yeah. again? Okay. No. Yep. Okay. The two servers in, in the environment. Here we're looking at certain settings for server one. Then we flipped over to the settings for server two, and you'll see at the bottom, you'll see we have a blank value, the additional instance type setting. Here we go back to server one, and we'll insert a value. So that's a setting, which is a hash that describes a new instance type. We'll save that, and I will go to the console for server one, and we'll run the script, and we'll pass in a path to the setting that we wish to replicate. And so the output indicates how, which servers the setting was applied to. So in this case, it was server two. Then we go back to the settings for server two, go to the same setting, which is additional instance types, refresh and you'll see that the setting was applied. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. For the Azure provider, um, Adam added some logging to the Azure refresh. And so it records the timings, the counts, and the memory consumption of all inventory types. And to record the memory consumption, you must enable debug logging in advanced settings. So this has already proven to be very helpful troubleshooting um, as there are refresh issues in the field. Next slide, please. Um, so Dan Berger made some very effective uh, performance improvements to private image collection in the Azure provider. Um, so Dan's going to speak to that. Over to you, Dan. Yes, yeah, so in the, uh, for the Azure provider for uh, private image collection, we noticed we were consuming excessive amounts of memory, so we needed a way to reduce that. Um, <clears throat> And to understand what I did, uh, I just want to provide a little context for uh, Azure. So VMs on Azure are, uh, for unmanaged storage, are backed by a storage account. Here, let me start this. Hopefully you can all see my uh, screen here. So this is the Azure portal. Um, and I'm just going to go look at uh, one of my VMs. This is our dev environment. Um, <clears throat> And in addition to um, storing uh, VHD files, it also stores, uh, if it's enabled, it will store diagnostic information. So there's the storage account that's back in the diagnostic information. And if we look at that storage account, we can see that, oh, one second. So there, you know, the storage account stores the blobs, 
These are all stored in containers. Each one of these is a container. And if we inspect on those containers, we can see the files inside. Now, if we go back and just look at um, a non-diagnostic container, we can see what we are generally looking for, which are just the VHD files. Because when we uh, are gathering private image data, we're looking for a specific set of files with a specific set of properties. And here, this is what you typically will see. And there's there's the VM backing or the VHD file backing the VM on the storage account. So the issue um, <clears throat> was is as we were what we were doing was we were iterating over every storage account in the region, looking through every container and looking at every file in every container. And that uh, that was a problem because it uh, created a lot of intermediate objects and that was um, consuming a lot of memory. So what I realized with the help of Nick L and Bill um, was that we don't really need to look at boot diagnostic containers. And in our dev environment, that's over half the containers. So just this line, let us, just skipping all the boot diagnostic containers, which means we weren't inspecting all the files inside those containers, let us save about 20% of our memory. And that is it. Just uh, bar chart just illustrates the, the memory savings. Three different tasks that were run, so on average it was around about 20%. Next slide. Thank you to Alex. Thanks, Brenna. So for the uh, container providers, so Kubernetes and OpenShift, um, we found and fixed two metrics collection bugs. Yakov found that we were effectively doubling the net usage rate average, so we're making the uh, physical network guys look great because there was double the bandwidth that there should have been. Um, but we've <laughs> removed that feature. Um, <laughs> and then Marcel, when we were actually looking at a completely different bug, found that if we failed to collect metrics in containers, we were actually setting last perf capture on and returning no counters, which meant that we would never go back and retry from the failed point. So that's a really good fix that we, uh, that we applied in this sprint. And for the inventory refresh side, they have enable batch saving by default. Um, so that is going to help reduce the memory usage during the save inventory piece. Next slide, please. Uh, the middleware guys ended up uh, fixing a number of issues with cross-linking and their JDR uh, report generation. A um, couple of small things, uh, usability enhancements, disabling buttons when something's not valid. So uh, a bunch of good fixes there. Next slide. Uh, some of the other providers, uh, OpenStack added create and delete actions for images, so um, uh, templates for OpenStack. Uh, for Rev, they, for a long time, the provider supported the ability to create a template from a VM, but they never had the button enabled. So in this sprint, they enabled that so you can publish a VM and create a template from it. And they also enabled um, targeted refresh for a new template, um, probably came out of the ability to actually create a template from a VM. Um, so now they had created a new create a new target based on an event for VMs, and now they do the same thing for templates. And Lenovo uh, had a couple event catcher fixes and uh, added an EMS ref to the event stream table, which we found can actually be used uh, for more than Lenovo. Um, they expect to use it for Prometheus, and we expect to use it for VMware as well. So some good core enhancements coming from the Lenovo team. Next slide. And for the general metrics uh, area, Keenan changed the perf capture timer to be more EMS centric. So instead of working directly on zones, uh, it works more on EMSs and that's uh, supporting some enhancements that we're hoping to be making in the next uh, sprint or two. And Lattice added an active metrics uh, connection 
uh, type, which uses batch insert and update, uh, which ended up reducing uh, per process time by about 92% when you have, I think that was six days worth of metrics. Um, so brought the time down from about five minutes to like 20 seconds. Um, so that's also something that we're looking to use by default in the next sprint. Next slide. Okay, so Automate had 32 PRs merged to Sprint, 17 enhancements, 3 bugs, 10 refactoring, and 2 technical debt. Do continue his work on the Automate workspace by adding API calls to fetch and update the workspace. Um, as we said previously, this is really important because it gives external methods the ability to, uh, to manipulate the Automate workspace. Lucy continued her work on generic objects by adding the new add to service or move to, from service methods. Bill continued... <coughs> Finished his work on moving the um, or orchestration templates to the provider repos and added YAML support for Amazon templates. Previously, only JSON support was, was uh, supported, or JSON format was supported. Next slide, please. As Adam mentioned, the Rev team added the ability to publish VM to a template. Um, Drew Yu gave Automate Methods the ability to update the dynamic dive box description fields. And Billy Fitz made a service retirement fix that's important because we had an issue where um, we were allowing the retirement state machine to run multiple times, and this was a problem because every time it entered the state machine, uh, an email would be generated, so customers received multiple emails for a single uh, service retirement. Next slide, please. Billy Fitz added some new dialogues for VMware Placement Cluster, and this gives the users the ability to manually, place, manually do placement for clusters by still using the auto placement for the host and data stores. Next slide, please. And the same is true with folders. They can manually select a folder and still use auto placement for the for the other stuff. And that's it for automate. Over to Greg. Okay, thanks. So on, on the platform side, we have a pretty decent increase in PRs for this this sprint. Um, although I think most of it is in technical debt. We we had a lot of those PRs, um, but there are some enhancements and and bug fixes that I'd like to talk about. I guess the the first thing is that um, now we support Ruby 2.4. Um, so you can use 2.4 in the development environment, that should all work. Um, there's still some work to be done to get that into the builds, um, and that, that's ongoing. Um, there's a couple of links there that you can look at, too, with some more information. Um, Ruby 2.2 will be dropping support for that. You can read about that as well. Um, Tim did some more work on custom buttons to expose the vis visibility and enablement. I think that, that supports the stuff that Chris mentioned earlier. Um, and it was a small uh, enhancement done on the report editor, actually from, from uh, someone on our team, to show the default system timeout for um, report generation so that uh, um, the selection was basically system default and you never knew what that was, so you wouldn't know what the timeout was um, when you're selecting it. So just a little helpful thing there you're going to mention. Um, some significant bug fixes. Um, Bo, um, fixed, um, he added proxy support for embedded Ansible, that wasn't there. And um, actually it was discovered in our testing environment for IPv6 because you can't get out on the IPv6 network and wouldn't, they weren't able to get to, to get repos for Ansible. Um, and now um, it's just that basically we, we take the proxy settings that you would def you would configure on the managed IQ side and reconfigure that for embedded Ansible as well. Um, and then it was a fix to um, actually chargeback rate assignment was would be completely broken if you went and deleted a tag that was referenced in the assignment. Like if you said assign assign a chargeback rate to all VMs that are tagged as prod, and then you went and deleted the prod tag, it actually blew up. You couldn't actually fit, uh, uh, edit your rate assignments anymore. That was fixed. Actually, that, that was a bug that was probably there for a long time. It's surprising that it wasn't discovered earlier. Um, and Libor made a change uh, to uh, RBAC, uh, it did a fix for RBAC, uh, supporting these belongs to filters for the um, hierarchy for um, network managers and cloud networks. Um, the RBAC rules being configured there were not being honored. Um, Yuri did a couple changes too, he fixed uh, um, an issue with re uh, seeding reports and widgets that actually was exposed because the name of a report was changed. Um, in, in the seating, we were actually um, comparing the, uh, the timestamp on the, the YAML file that we used to seed with the updated 
timestamp in the database. And we realized that actually with, with the, the way we do the builds, that that's not reliable. Um, we also realized that it's probably not necessary, so we removed that and had fixed, fixed that issue. Um, there was also a fix that Yuri did to asynchronously destroy events um, when you delete a server, because that was actually just kind of hanging or timing out. And now we queue that up and then let that happen in the background. And I should just mention um, for the Ruby 2.4 support, that, that work was done by uh, Chris A and Jason and LJ as well and, and some others. That's it. I think I ripped through that pretty fast. <laughs> Let me turn it over to Alberto. Okay, thanks for, for the rest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on the never gets old. Never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on so the um, API side, we had a handful of announcements. Uh, first one is by Kaina, where we have uh, new collections uh, for supporting middleware endpoints. So uh, with all these, you know, you can do your regular collection searches. Uh, fetching an individual research uh, resource as well as doing bulk queries via the query action. So we have the new endpoints, middleware, data sources, deployments, domains, messagings, and servers. Next slide, please. Okay, the next enhancement uh, by, by Madhu. Um, so here uh, we are now exposing the automate workspaces um, to allow, you know, helps the uh, automate system manage uh, the workspaces via the API. Um, different than the other, collection, the other collections, these collections cannot be queried, so you can't just ask what's what's running currently, but you can access an uh, individual uh, resource by GUID. Um, so here showing the uh, individual GET on uh, Automate Workspace, and so we support the GET and then as well as the POST. So we have the edit action, in this example just editing uh, an attribute in the root and state bars. Uh, next slide, please. All right, also by Madhu, we have a new enhancements uh, where we're exposing the custom attributes for cloud instances. Earlier, that was uh, being made available for VMs and providers. Um, but anyways, it's the same signature for the other ones. Um, essentially, the uh, names and value pairs um, as resources and showing here below the example. So, querying the custom attributes of instances um, as well, you know, just them, or you can expand the resources, um, adding, editing, and deleting them. Again, same signature as what we do today, just uh, expose for instances. Next slide, please. All right, uh, next enhancement is by Jillian. Uh, so here we needed, uh, for the new generic objects, we needed to support tagging. Um, so we'll expose the, uh, the tag subcollection to generic objects. And uh, same you know, standard signature of assigning and unassigning here. You can see the examples. We have a couple of uh, tags by category and name um, being assigned and unassigned. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, a new enhancement by Tim. Uh, so we're now exposing the event streams. Um, so the new collection API slash event on our streams. Um, similar to the metrics, we enforce paging. Uh, default is a thousand items, just because well, it could be a large collection, um, and uh, supporting the searches and bulk queries like we do. So, uh, similar to the metrics, we have supported parameters where we can query by target type, timestamp, uh, as well as event type, uh, or getting an individual event stream as well as the uh, bulk queries. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next uh, enhancement by Jillian. So, uh, so earlier, uh, to query the VMs of a provider, you, you would essentially fetch the relationship. So attributes equal VMs. While that worked, it didn't provide us with filtering, sorting, or paging, especially when you have thousands of them. So what we've done now is uh, formally expose the VM subcollection to providers. So here showing an example, just fetching the VMs, and you could do all the filtering or paging. Uh, and the next example, we can query multiple providers, search certain providers, and then expand their VMs. So, and next slide, please. All right, and lastly, yes, so uh, enhancement by Jillian. Uh, so earlier, you know, while we provided the, uh, the, user's, uh, the user's entitlement as far as his, uh, his group membership, uh, as shown here with the 
on the main entry point onto identity, you had groups. Uh, so while that was good enough for being able to switch, uh, the UI needed additional information for better performance, um, as was mentioned earlier. So what we do right now is, in addition to the groups, we also uh, tag in the MIQ groups, which is you know, essentially the the object specific uh, specification for these groups, so IDs, HREFs, and what have you. So, And I think that's it for the API. Next slide, please. Hi, for documentation in this sprint, we have had uh, seven PRs merged, four of which were enhancements, three related to bugs. Um, highlights for there, including some corrections to commands in the high availability proxy instructions. Uh, maintenance was done to the high availability guide, uh, some additional repository maintenance, and some LDAP updates in the general configuration guide. Next slide, please. All right. And, uh... That concludes our Sprint 70 review. I'd like to say thank you for to everyone who was involved, and uh, looking forward to uh, more uh, another great Sprint in Sprint 71. Thanks, everyone.